I have a message from the Lord Hallelujah This message unto you I'll give Tis recorded in His Word Hallelujah It is only that you look and live I have a message full of love Hallelujah, a message, oh my friend, for you. It is a message from above. Hallelujah, Jesus said it, and I know it is true. Look and leave, my brother. Leave. witness this mid-year prayer meeting. There is nothing we don't can do without him. And we know that it is he that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if God has not made it possible, we will not be here today. Let us do something for the Lord God Almighty. Let us appreciate it. Thank you. In the same vein, I want to show my deep appreciation to the leadership of the Kingdom Message Interdenominational Ministry. I consider it a great honor to be called upon to share with us the message of life, the message of Christ. I want to thank you, sir. I want to thank you, ma. I want to thank the executive for allowing me to stand before you today. And it is my prayer that we will see not man today, but Christ, risen and seated in the heavenly places at the right hand of God the Father. Let us bow down our heads in prayers. Father, we thank you for this grace and privilege you have given us to gather in your name and to learn at the feet of Jesus. We ask, therefore, merciful Father, that you will break the fallow grants of our hearts today. And prepare, O oh Lord, the soil of our hearts, that it may receive the truth of your word, and that the truth may grow and bring forth fruit made for repentance. In the name of Jesus. Let us be seated. The first thing we want to look at today is victory through the knowledge of the finished work. And I want us to realize that we are not talking about just any finished work, but the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. So that as we continue to look into the word of God, we will be able to place into context what we are actually talking about today. It is about the finished work of Christ on the cross. But before I go into the teaching, there are two songs that were coming to my mind when I was preparing for today. And I think they capture in summary everything I want to say. One of them does not even belong, the two of them don't belong to this generation. So I don't expect many people to know them. 
But as the second one, many of us we know. The first one is sung by C and S are your new. And in that song, they say, if you know, you join me to sing. Hallelujah. How many of us doesn't understand your rubber here? Plenty. All right, God bless you. I will try to paraphrase that song. He said, Oh, my friend, please pay attention to my words. If you have Jesus, you have everything. And that Jesus will fill your mouth with laughter and joy. He said, Because out of the holy mountain, the Lord will fulfill his purposes. Hallelujah. The second one is like it. It is the common maxim of the scripture union of old. And that is God said it. I believe it. That settles it. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. If you have Jesus, you have everything. If you have Jesus, you already have the victory that is in Christ Jesus. And the victory that is in Christ Jesus is a victory that no one can stand again against ever and ever and that is why we can boldly say that because i have christ all things are possible hallelujah that victory we are talking about but before we go into it i want us to read some scriptural passages John 8, 31 to 32. Please, I want people to open and start reading. Philippians 3, 9 to 10. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. Mm -hmm. They said Jesus to those Jews mm -hmm. which believed on me. Mm -hmm. If you continue in my word, mm -hmm. then ye are my disciple in this. Mm -hmm. And ye shall know the truth, mm -hmm. and the truth shall make you free. Then said Jesus to the Jews who believe, believe in, if you continue in my words, what will happen to you? Eh? You are what? My disciples indeed. Then what happens to you as a disciple? What is the expectation of Christ about his disciples? You shall know the truth. And then when you know the truth, what will happen to you? You will be set free. You will walk in victory. You will be liberated from every bondage. From everything that holds you down. So when somebody is in Christ, it's a liberated soul. When you are in Christ, when you know the Lord Jesus, you are already delivered. You are already loosened from every shame and shackles. And nothing has the power to hold you down any longer because it has been settled 
Let us read Philippians 3, 9 to 10. Demanding him, not having my own righteousness, mm -hmm. which is of the law, mm -hmm. but that which is through the faith of Christ, mm -hmm. the righteousness which is of God by faith, mm -hmm. that I may know him, mm -hmm. and the power of his resurrection. Please read verse 9 again, ma. Him, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. We will address this one more when I come for the second session. That will be the core of what we will be teaching at that time. But let us take note of this. Now you find in him through the faith of who? We are talking about victory through the knowledge of the finished work of that same Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. Although we live in the world, mm -hmm. we do not wage war as the world does. Mm -hmm. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Now, this, you know, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. When you are talking about victory, you are talking about battle. There cannot be victory if there is no battle. Is that not so? It's now telling us that yes, there is a battle. Do you get what I'm saying? But the weapons with which we will pursue this battle is not carnal. All right, ma'am. The weapons we fight with are mm -hmm. not the weapons of the world. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, mm -hmm. they have divine power. They have divine power. To demolish strongholds. To demolish what? Strongholds. Uh -huh. We demolish arguments. To demolish arguments. And every pretensions. And every pretensions. That sets itself up against the knowledge of God. That sets itself up against what? The knowledge of God. Please take note of these scriptures because we'll be using them to explain all we are going to say today. There is something about your mind that I pray that God will open our eyes to see today. And then you will be able to sing like that hymn writer. The battle is over. The Hallelujah. Victory. The word victory. In the New Testament. Means to conquer. Because the root word from which it is taken. Is Nike. And what that word means. Is that you conquer. That you overcome. That you prevail. So when we are talking about victory through knowledge of the finished work of Christ, we are talking about a life of a conqueror, the life of an overcomer, the life of somebody who prevails in every situation and circumstances of life. And don't forget that in the provision that Christ has made for us, what he made us to know is this, you are more than conquerors. Through Christ that strengthens you. The word used to describe a conqueror in that passage from the original writing is upenikao. Now, do you know what upenikao means? Mm -hmm. eh? It means that you are a super conqueror. You are not just a conqueror. No, that English word does not capture. The original Greek very well. When you are saying somebody is super, people can be active, right? But when you say somebody is hyper active, you know there's another degree, another level of activeness in that person. And that's the kind of thing Jesus Christ, uh, the Bible was talking about when he said, You are Hupenikao. 
that word hope is where the English word hyper derives its root is uh, uh, is derived from hyper to be extra. So you are more than conqueror because you are a super conqueror, a super overcomer in Christ Jesus. Why then do we need to have this victory? The fall of man and the consequences is the number one reason. Everything we struggle with today, every battle of life today, every challenge you and I may be going through, through today, everything we may be wrestling with today have their roots traced to the garden of Eden. When the devil succeeded in making man submit his authority to him because man bowed not to the knowledge that God has given them but to the new knowledge that Satan came to give them. We will still address that one more. So, by that singular action, man became subject to satanic influences. Because man has submitted to Satan, his will, his sovereignty, then Satan became the ruler of the heart of man. Don't forget that whosoever you subject yourself to a slave is the one who controls your life. He is the one that your destiny is determined by. And all that the devil has to offer is what? To kill, to steal, and to destroy. Even when Satan gives you good things, it is only for this same purpose. To kill, to steal, and to destroy. It is like the hen you have in your cage. You know we pretend to love the hen. Is that not so? We take care of them. We feed them. Even when they are sick, we go and call the veterinary doctor. Come and treat my hand for me. Why are we doing that? Eh? The day is coming when your child will celebrate birthday. Oh, you will have one good thing to rejoice in in your home. What happens to that hand? You slaughter it. So all your care for it. It's not because of love. It's because of what you want to achieve at the end of the day. When Satan is having this rapport with you, when Satan is touching your head for and rubbing it, and you are placing your head in sleep upon the lap of Satan, and you feel like this is world, this is life, don't forget you are like the hen that is in the cage. In the fullness of time, it will strike. So, Satan has nothing to offer than destruction. And the manifestation of those destruction is all we see in the world today. Sickness, barrenness, ailments, poverty, all sorts of challenges, but above all, a struggle and battle with sin. So, we become weak in the flesh, and then we also face the assault of the world. I have mentioned three things. Number one, Satan influences which could be demonic or any other thing so when we are talking about satanic influences we are talking about demonic influences too 
Number two is the flesh that is battling you. Number three is the world that you are battling with. You know, in one of our hymns, the hymn writer called these three things the snares of hell. What did they call them? Many of you may know that song. Be thou my guide, Yanan, my guide, and hear me when I call. Oh, let my sleep pray for self slide and hold me lest I fall. One of the stanzas now said, The world, the flesh, and Satan dwell around the path I trod. Oh, save me from the snares of hell, thou quick now of the dead. This constitutes the snares of hell. The battle axe of Satan by which he purposes to draw your soul unto himself, the world, and the system, your flesh, and his demonic forces. Now I want us to realize something. That in these battles of life, this battle with flesh, this battle with Satan and demonic forces, this battle with the world and the system. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, when you read from that uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, that the weapon of our warfare is not what? Is not carnal. Let somebody help us to read it from King James Version. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Praise the Lord. I'm connecting this battle to our minds. The weapon of our phobia is not carnal but mighty through God to do what? Eh? It will pull down struggles by casting down what? Imaginations. And what? And every I think that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is the battle we are fighting. It is a battle of the mind. But the wrong notion that a lot of preachers has made us to accept in the church over the years is that our battle looks more like a physical thing, a contention with demons, a contention with uh, principalities and powers and spiritual forces and other things. Yes. They have their battle set and arrayed against us. But we don't go battling by facing them. You walk on your mind. The weapons of your warfare, what they want to accomplish in you, is not to help you to begin chasing demons all around. It's not to, be, to help you to be running elter skelter is to help you to do what? To pull down the strongholds that Satan has established in your heart. Eh? In your heart, in your mind. It will help you to cast down imaginations. Remember Job. 
Remember the battle of the life of Job? They were a product of his imagination. In Job chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, he said, The things that I greatly fear, they are the things that came upon him. So, where the devil succeeded in cashing Job was in the realm of his mind. And that is why it matters who is ruling and reigning in your heart. Because whosoever has the control of your mind controls your destiny. Whoever has control of your heart determines the direction of your life, determines and dictates what happens to you. So, the battle of life are fought in the mind. Let us also go to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 to 5. It is important that we establish this first before we connect it to the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 11, verses 3 to 5. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Take it easy, man. I fear. What was the fear of Paul here? Mm hmm. That set step serpent. Who is that serpent? Satan and through whatsoever means he wants to use for you the world, the flesh, demonic powers, or whatsoever. Philosophies of this world. Lest he, through whatever means, beguile you. Yes, ma. Through his subtlety. Yes. So that your mind, so that your mind will be what? So when Satan wants to cash you, it goes for your mind. Where does he fire his arrow? Where does he fire his arrow? Where is the target of his arsenal? Your mind or your heart. Let's use those two words interchangeably. So, when you feel like these wishes, they have been tormenting me for years. You have been going from mountain to mountain, from hill to hill, from river to river, from camp to camp, you are seeking solution. A lot of times, when you see people who love those activities, they stay long too in their problem. What did I say? They stay long in their problem. Because where the battle is, where Satan is having an inroad into your life, that is now empowering the principalities and powers to be able to torment you. Is where? Is your mind. <laughs> this is what you have to deal with. That is said the other time. If you know nonsense, what is in what is the result you will in your life? And if you know the truth. It will set you free. <laughs> John 8, 32. Read on, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's okay, man. What happened at the Garden of Eden? Eve was beguiled. Her mind was the target. You know, mind is the seat of knowledge, is the seat of understanding, is the seat of thought. That is where you think, that is the seat of reason. That's where you think, that is where you reason, that is where you hold knowledge. So when Satan came to Eve, what was the strategy? Change the knowledge, perverse the truth. And all kind of calamity will naturally follow them. And he succeeded. What did he say? As God said, you should not eat from 
These fruits said, ah, no, 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 no. He didn't say we should not eat them. He said we can eat everything except the tree at the center, the fruit of the tree at the center of the garden. He said because the day we eat it, what will happen to us? That is the knowledge of God. That is the knowledge that God has transmitted to them. That is the truth that was revealed to them as at that time. Satan said, it is not so. It is not what? It is not so. The, if you eat it, you will not die. You will only become like God. Where are all these things taking place? The target was to change our mind. To change our knowledge of the truth that God has revealed to her and her husband. And the moment she accepted the wrong knowledge and ate of the fruit, death came. Destruction came. Calamity came. Suffering came. Pain came. Sorrow came. Sickness came. All kinds of battles of life unleashed on mankind. If our mind has been protected by the weapons of our warfare to cast out the evil imagination that Satan was launching into our heart, she will have victory. She will not eat the fruit. And you and I will not be in the problem we are in today. So if there is anything we need to understand is that the knowledge of Christ is important in the battles and challenges of life. And it is not just important, it is the thing that you need. What do I say? Look at when Satan came to Jesus at his temptation. Do you know it was also his mind he went for? He brought the knowledge of God as written in the scripture and tried to change the mind of Christ about it. He gave him incorrect interpretations of the scripture. He knows that the moment he consumed, he accepts and consumes the wrong interpretation, he is done for. So where the devil will continually hide is to take charge of our heart. And he does that through the world, through the flesh, and through Satan's. So therefore, brethren, battles that are lost in the mind are lost in reality. Any battle that is lost in your mind, you will lose it in the real life. What do I say? You will lose it in reality. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it comes what? The issues of life and death. So the realm of the mind is a place where you ascertain your victory. Satan's strategy is in poisoning our minds, polluting it with wrong knowledge, thereby choking out the truth. So if there is anything that you and I need today, it is to have the knowledge of the truth. And remember when Jesus confronted some of the religious people of his days. Do you remember his word of challenge to them? They, they, they prided themselves that they knew scripture. They followed scripture. They observed everything. And what did he tell them? He said, ye study the scripture. Because in it you think you will find life. But there are they which testify 
of me. So that knowledge of life that you are seeking is who? Is Christ. Christ is all. Christ is in all. So that reality must come to us. That our mind must never be allowed to be polluted. Whatever you are led to believe in your heart becomes the reality of your life. Job 3, 24 to 26, I've quoted that, so I'm not reading it again. But the conclusion of it is that the things that I greatly fear in my mind has come what? Has come to pass. So you say, where does the battle come from? Even where does temptation come from? And what did the Bible say? From the loss, the evil desires of our hearts. Hallelujah. What actually was God's response? What was his strategy to this issue of the battles of life? That we seek victory, that we seek victory over. God's strategy to the multivarious challenges of men has always been knowledge. What do I say? Knowledge. And that knowledge, you can use different words for it. We can say delight. We can call it the truth. We can call it the word of God. Do you hear all the synonyms I use for that knowledge? Light. Truth. The word of God. And when you look at it critically, every of those words are symbolically representing who? Representing Christ is the light of the world. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 12, he said, and the light shine in darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend him. That is talking about Jesus Christ, whom it has as least earlier said that he is the light of the world. The light that came into the world. When you are talking of the truth, he even declared it categorically, I am the way the truth and the life. When you are talking about the word, John 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was who? God himself. And that word took flesh and came into the world and it dwells among men. Who was he referring to? Jesus Christ. So if knowledge Is the embodiment of what you need to have the life of victory is simply Jesus that you need. Hallelujah. And it's simply the understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Let's look at evidences of this from the scripture. At the Garden of Eden, God equipped man with knowledge. So that it could escape Satan's compelling influences. God knew what Satan could do. Do you get what I'm saying? God knew. And so when God created man, do you know that the first thing that God did was to give him knowledge? You know the very first words that Jesus, that God spoke to man was impartation of knowledge. Time will not permit us to be opening, no. But when you go to Genesis chapter 2, after God created man, what did the Bible say? And God blessed them. First thing, he pronounced his blessing. And said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the heart and have dominion over every and so on and so forth. You know, we usually think that those are the blessings. Those are not the blessings. Those are instructions. Am I communicating? After he blessed them, he now started giving them instruction. He started giving them what? My expectation for you. What can sustain this relationship between us? Is that what I have in mind for you is that you go, be fruitful, 
Go, multiply. Go, take dominion. Over what? Everything, including Satan himself. And the Bible says that in the cool of the day, what does God usually do? What is the essence of the fellowship? He speaks to them. When you go to Exodus chapter 25, and you read from verse 1, when you read from verse 1 to 8, God instructed Moses. He said, gather all kind of materials. Gold, silver, and this and that. He said, after you have gathered them, build a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. So God's desire, God's solution to their challenge is, number one, his presence in their midst. Number two, when you now fast forward to verse, is it verse 22? Before verse 22, he now instructed Moses, he said, make an altar of sheeting wood, lay it with gold, then create also a, um, a bed of sheeting wood, also coated with um, gold. It's called it the mercy seat. He said, place it upon the altar. And fashion out two cherubims, their wings facing one another, and place it upon that place, and place it in the holy of the holies. What is the essence of it? He said, dear, I will speak with you. Hallelujah. That is the place where God communicates his mind to his people in those days. As long as the sanctuary is there, the presence of God is with them. And as long as they can enter into the holy of the holies, where the Shekinah of God is, the glory of God is. Do you get what I'm saying? God will speak with them. God will speak unto them. We are talking about knowledge. Victory. Through what? Through knowledge. I'm establishing from the scriptures that this relationship has been an issue of knowledge. The victory from times past has been an issue of knowledge. Let's see first. By knowledge, God guided the Israelites through Moses to cross the Red Sea. By what? How will most, can Moses ever know that if he stretches his, his um, rod, that the sea will part? How did he get the knowledge? When others were murmuring, what was he doing? He was praying, looking upward. And God spoke. God said, stretch your rod. And they had a victory that was humanly impossible. That was not all though. Let's look at another one. Throughout the time of the prophets, God when they have challenges and troubles, God will raise a prophet. And what was their purpose? To bring back the knowledge of God. When they have allowed themselves to be open to corrupting influences, God will raise a prophet to bring back the knowledge of God. Look at the example of Extra. The revival that took place under Extra. Nehemiah and Extra. After Nehemiah has built, the extra describe came. You remember the story? Because time will not permit us to be going into looking into all the scriptures. And they said he started reading the word of today unto them. And that knowledge changed their fortune. So what we need at all times is the knowledge that God is imparting to us. Therefore, what is this knowledge? What is this knowledge we are talking about? We have looked at the word victory. Let us dwell a bit on the word knowledge. The word knowledge in the Old Testament, there are two words used for it. The first one is naka, which means to know, to recognize, or to be acquainted with something. And the basic meaning of the term is a physical apprehension 
whether through sight, touch, or hearing. Physical what? Apprehension. To apprehend, to comprehend something. The second word is yada. And that is to know by observing and reflecting. Thinking. Observing and then reflecting. Or to know by experiencing. Because that will take us back to what we need to do about having this knowledge of Christ. His finished work on the cross. You need to experience it. You need to think and reflect upon it. Hmm? So that the reality of it can set in on your mind. So that it can renew your mind. You know, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is the knowledge of Christ that renews your mind. The knowledge of the word of God. Now, in the New Testament, there are also two words. Genosco, which is to know or to understand or to recognize. Or, so to say, to know completely. And emphasis is on that word completely. To understand something in totality. It frequently indicates a relationship between the person knowing and the object known. Take note. There is a difference here. We are seeing knowing at another level now. At a deeper level. Knowing is not just artificial intelligence. Do you get what I'm saying? If I see you tomorrow, sir, I will claim to know you. Because I saw you here. Before now, we have never met. But if anybody see me and you tomorrow and say, I do not know this, but yes, I know him. He was at the kingdom uh, message. In Is that really knowing? But if my wife is standing here and somebody said, do you know this woman? Do I really know her? Is it the same level of knowing that I know my brother? What is the difference? This knowing is based on relationship. Based on what? So when we are talking about knowing, knowing this, uh, having the knowledge through the finished work, we are talking about knowing Christ in a personal relationship manner. Having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is not just head knowledge, but heart knowledge. So, the other word is to see or to have perceived, and that's what is order. Now, the basis of our relationship with God is faith that is based on knowledge. What do I call it? I'm going back to all I've been saying before. Faith that is based on knowledge. In the Garden of Eden, after God created man and woman, he started speaking to them. Isn't it? Isn't it? He started imparting knowledge. And they believed. And don't forget, Abraham believed in God. And it was accounted to him as what? Righteousness. Because... And don't forget that, that we are made righteous by faith. Look at the interconnection, no? Eh? By faith. So that believing is exercising of faith. In what God said. The battles of their life started. When they lost faith in what God said. And took on another knowledge. Am I communicating with somebody? Yes, that is when their battle started. So, but human relationship with God has always been based on knowledge. I cited the example of Exodus chapter... Uh, uh, okay, let's, let's start with Colossians 2 verse 6. What does it say? Colossians chapter 2 verse 6.
Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, this faith is what we should abound in. Because our relationship with God is based on that faith. And that faith is based on knowledge. It's based on what? How then shall they have faith? How then shall they believe? If they will, yes, faith comes by what? And hearing. Now, how will they believe if there's nobody to teach? If there's nobody to impart the knowledge? So basically, is he talking about faith? That comes by what? By knowledge. By hearing of the truth. Hallelujah. So, our relationship with God is knowledge-based. And so, it is a covenant relationship that is sustained by our knowledge of the truth. Colossians 3, 9 and 10, what does it say? Why not one to another? Mm-hmm. 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 Knowledge of the truth. Knowing this, that you have put off. He's talking about knowledge. Knowing this, that you have done what? Put off the old man. And knowing that you have put on the new, which is what? Renewed in what? In knowledge. After the image of him that created him. Do you see now? This journey of faith. You start by faith. And that faith comes by the knowledge of the truth you have. Then it is renewed, that is to say, it is sustained by what? By the same knowledge. Because that knowledge will continually produce faith in your heart. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Are we still together? So, let's look at instances. I have told us earlier that God guided Adam and Eve by the knowledge of truth. Is that not so? He also related with Israel by the same. And I cited the example of the construction of the temple and its purpose. Then, when you look at all the time of Israel in the wilderness, even post-wilderness experience, they always live a victorious life as long as they know and lived in the will of God. Look at the example of Balaam and Balak. Balak hired Balaam. Curse these people for me. And the man said, how can I curse those people that God has not caused? At the end of the day, he gave them a cancer. Because of money. If you can make these people to go against the knowledge of God. Entice their young men to go into the toku and commit adultery and whatever. Generally, just make them to commit sin. Do you know that as long as they were walking in the knowledge that God has revealed, all the laws that God has given them through Moses, no enemy could conquer them. They were living a victorious life. It's not that there were no battles. At least Balak was against them. Nations around them were against them, but they could not do anything. Without fighting any battle, they were living in victory. Do you know that that is what God wants for you? Without fighting any battle, for you to be living in victory. That is why he told them, this battle is not yours. It is mine. And he now said, he fights for me. And I hold my peace. More on your minute, just enjoy my life. My enemy are there fighting. But God is the one fighting my own 
battle. Hallelujah. So they were living this victorious life. But when Balak succeeded in making them to sin, then curses and evil came upon them. Look at the time, the, the, the time of the man, Achan. As long as they were walking in the knowledge of God, do you know that they were winning battles? Don't forget that they did not have weapon of war. Don't forget they didn't have weapon of war. Years later, over a thousand years later, when David became the king, the only sword in Israel was the sword of Goliath. He took from Goliath. And the one that Saul gave him to go and fight with. When they were leaving Egypt, they took gold, they took other things, but they didn't take weapons of war. But no nation with established army could defeat them. They didn't have an organized or trained army, but organized and trained army with chariots and weapons of war could never defeat them in battle. Why? They were walking in the knowledge of God. They were doing what? But whenever they changed that knowledge, I can. The knowledge was don't touch anything that is there. Don't take it for your death. What did they can do? Pick the beautiful, walk out of the knowledge. What was the result? A disaster. They lost the battle. When God told them to go and um, possess the land, and they said we are like what? Like grasshopper. God revealed through Joshua and Caleb, we are able to go. They rejected that knowledge. They took the other one from Satan. We are like grass. They refused to go. When, they, when Moses has scolded them, they said we will now go. God told Moses by revelation, they should not go again. If you go, I will not go with you. What was the result? They missed divine timing because they didn't follow the knowledge of God. The knowledge that is revealed unto them. May God help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, to gain anything from God, you must have a knowledge of him in that light. When God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Horeb, you remember what he told him? Who is it that sent me? And they said, I am. That's a revelation of himself. He didn't give him a name. Till today, Israel don't know the name of God though. Maybe you don't know. They don't, that is why we have confusion about what to call them. Some call him Jehovah. Some call him Yahweh. They don't know the name. All they know is... <laughs> let, let me go into all those deep, 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 deep things because it will be lengthening our time. But God revealed himself as I am. Do you know the meaning of I am? I can be anything I choose to be. That's the meaning. I can be what? Whatever I want to be is what I am. So there is nothing God cannot be to you. If you have the knowledge that it can be that, it will be that to you. When they were to enter Jericho, wall, that wall is as wide as this hall. The wall of Jericho. You know they have houses hewn inside. It's as big as this hall. They said four chariots of war can be run inside. So it's a, it's a double lane express. Not just double lane. Two lane here, two lane here. Express road. That's the size. Which is something like, I think it should be bigger than this express road. That has two cars here too. Will be bigger than this. That is the size of the wall of Jericho. They had no single weapon. How were they going to bring it down? Then Jesus appeared to him. You know, they said he saw an angel. God appeared to him. And he said, who are you? Are you for us? Or against us? And he said, oh, I am the captain of the host of heaven. And he bowed down and worshipped him. And he didn't reject his worship. That means he's God. 
angel will not allow man to worship him. But Israelites don't call God God. A lot, they will say an angel. Because the name of God is too big for them to. When in Psalm 8, he said, Who is man that thou art mindful of him? You make him to be a little lower than angels. It's not angels they mean, no. You make him a little lower than yourself, God. But they will never mention the name of God. Israelites will never. So you will see them using the angel. 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 You know their, their belief is this. When you know the name of somebody, you have power over him. When you know the name of somebody, you can control him. And God is beyond control. Hallelujah. So even when they ask God, what did Moses ask him? God didn't give him his, them his name. He said, I am. That I am. Now God revealed himself to Joshua as the man of war. As a captain of the army of heaven. The result was what? The host of heaven pulled down the walls of Jericho. What did Israel have to do, the army of Israel, just to be marching and dancing around and blowing trumpets? Doing nothing. And the wall was what? Crashing down. Victory through the knowledge of Christ's finished work on the cross. In John, don't let me go into too much of that. But you, you see that anytime God wants to do something new in the life of the children of Israel, whatever they have not known him to be, they are not able to receive from him. He will have to reveal himself first as that thing. Then when they grab the understanding that this is who God is, then he can move in that dimension in their life. Example is that of Jericho I have talked about. Example is when he told Moses, I am. Moses understood perfectly. He's telling me he can do all things. That is why Moses could march and face his enemy, the man you ran away from, the man that has placed death sentence on your head, waiting for you to come and die and go and confront him. But because of our time, let me jump. I will jump the things that are there. Let me go to John chapter 19, verse, is it nineteen thirty? When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he now used the word, it is. When he laid down his life, what was the word? It is finished. Tetelestai. And that word, Tetelestai, how do I explain it? You know, sometimes English cannot express Greek very well. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> that is to say everything that surrounds your deliverance. You know, that word means everything around your salvation is what? Settled. It's finished. Everything that has to do with the bad tools of your life for your soul is what? Because salvation has been given to you. What Christ did was to put Satan under. What it means now is that man has been restored to his rightful place. You know the instruction was to go and have dominion over Satan. But by obeying Satan, man put himself under Satan. But now that Christ died, he took man from under Satan. And took him because the Bible says when we are when he died and was buried, he rose again, a new man. Is that not so? He said, We are also buried with him. And when we are buried with him, we rise with him as a new man. So the life we live is no longer our life, but the life of Christ. Paul says, It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So, in this new life, I am hid inside who? Inside who? Where is Christ? In the heavenly places. Seated at the right hand of God. 
far above all principalities. So where are you now? You are a Christian. You are still looking forward to go to heaven. Heaven has started here. Heaven has started what? Where? If you are in the embassy of USA in Nigeria, do you know that Nigerian law cannot, have, cannot apply to you? It's on Nigerian soil, but it is United States of America. So there are some people living here in Nigeria, but they are already in USA because they, they stay in the embassy. So when you are in Christ, you are already not just a candidate of heaven, a member of that kingdom of heaven. Do you get what I'm saying? You are already a member of that kingdom of heaven. And in heaven there is no sorrow. There is no pain. No evil thing. No corruption is there. It is a place of continuous victory. So in Christ Jesus, what he has done, he has finished it all on the cross. You already have your victory. You will now begin to wonder, why is it then that there are certain things in my life that doesn't seem to be working well? I said the battle is in your mind. Eh? Knowing this, anytime Paul wants to make any important point, he will say, knowing this. Don't forget that the greatest battle is the battle against sin. And when you go to Romans chapter 6 verse 6, let somebody quickly read for us. I want to round off. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Uh -huh. Knowing this. Now, he was telling them how to overcome the body of sin. And he's saying that the solution is what? Know this fact. It, see, it is in the knowing of what Christ has done that you have your victory. Knowing this, that you have been crucified with Christ. Uh -huh. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Uh -huh. That henceforth we should not serve sin. So you are not struggling with sin because Christ has not perfected it. On the cross it is finished. But the fact that you are still struggling with it is because of what you don't know. The body of Christ has been destroyed until you know that truth. You know it is when you know the truth that the truth will what? Set you free. So until that truth becomes real in your heart, you continue to struggle with sin. God does not expect you to struggle. He only expects you to believe on the finished work, on what he has done. Just be, That is why I sang that song. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it, I believe it, that You see, it is not the nature of man to accept what we don't really understand. But the way of God is that you believe. He told Thomas, oh, blessed is the one who has no sin, but believes. That is the blessed person. That is the one who will walk in victory over his sin. Why is it that sin still seems to raise its ugly head? When the body of sin has been shed, we no longer carry sin. Why do we then see, see, conduct, don't, when, see ourselves doing sinful things? It is because that you are a tripartite being. Spirit, soul, and body. Your, body, your spirit has been, got, it has been rid of the body of sin. 
it is now made righteous in Christ Jesus. But you have a mind. And the factors that control your mind are many. The spirit is controlling it. The flesh is communicating with it. And Satan can use your flesh and the world to communicate to your flesh. Now, they are preconditioned. Over the years, your mind has been conditioned to act in certain ways. But now that you have the new nature, the mind is still there. The flesh is still there. There is always a tendency for what you have been conditioned to be, to rear, he said. A lot of times you realize that you have done the thing before you... It's like a reflex action. But there is the way out. Have your mind renewed. What do you renew it with? The knowledge of Christ. It's a question of time. That struggle with sin. Because it's a battle that is won. Will fizzle out. The more of Christ that you know, therefore, the more of these benefits you will receive. So, therefore, children of God, every revelation is summed up in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 1 1 tells us that He came to save us. So, that is why He said it is finished. The word salvation, soteria, means to be delivered. To be preserved. Do you get what I'm saying? You are saved. You are delivered. You are preserved. That is why as a child of God, there is nothing to deliver you from again. What do I say? Mm -mm. Now your problem now is not demons again. They can't possess a child of God. You are in no-go area now. How can Christ be living in you? And the demon will say he wants to come there. Is it possible? But they will be attacking from outside. And what is the place where they will be attacking? Your mind. Because when you have the wrong knowledge, it will affect your life. Do you get what I'm saying? It will affect your life. So to get the right thought, therefore, is to have your mind filled with the knowledge of Christ. And what are we set free from? I want us to look at Isaiah 50, 11 before I go to that. Isaiah 53, 11. There are other passages here, but I will take only that one because of our time. Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see of the travail of the soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall what? My righteous servant, which is who? Justify who? All of us. By the knowledge. You see how central knowledge is to our relationship with God. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Uh -huh. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore. Therefore. I will divide him a portion with the look at the life of the victory that comes with that knowledge. Look at it. I will not divide him a portion with the great. Uh huh. Uh huh. He divide the spoil, the all the bad one and all with the strong. Because he has come out to sow unto death. Mm hmm. Oti Toma, thank you, man. Our time will not permit us. Romans 6, 6, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4, Matthew 14, 34 to 5, 36. So, by what Christ did on the cross, you are set free from sin. You are set free from the stronghold of Satan and all enemies. I want us to read Luke 1, 68 to 75. Luke 1, 68 to 75. Or oh, let me read from here so that uh, it won't take much of our time. Please let me read it from here. Luke 1. Listen, please. 
Listen, please. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which has been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, which and from the hand of all that hate us. This is the life of victory. That horn has come. And he has done it. He has saved us. And he told us at the point where he accomplished it. It is finished. I read on. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swear to our father Abraham. That he will grant unto us. That we being delivered. Out of the hand of our enemies. Might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So, God seeks worshippers. People will serve him in righteousness. And he will not allow anything to hinder them. And for this reason, the salvation package includes deliverance. What do I say? It includes deliverance. So, all that Satan is now doing, that make it look like there are Enemy and it is your what? Your ignorance. Your what? Your ignorance. That's why it looks like Satan is having his way and upper hand in your life. It's your ignorance. Paul will tell them, if you know this, this is the outcome. And we need to get to that realm. Let me end by telling you my own personal testimony. For years, after I gave my life to Christ, I used to battle demons. I used to battle. When I sleep, I will see myself flying with them. Because they will be pursuing me in my sleep. Oh, when they are pursuing me, I will be running. I will find myself in strange places, very strange places. House that looks like real labyrinth that will be flowing from one place to the other. You, you, you will enter into. And at a point in time, I will just run outside. And you know God is a merciful God. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my ignorance. He will give me wings. I will fly. I will do what? I will fly. And it happens almost every day for years. It's only when I fly that I soar above them. Do you get what I'm saying? I started speaking in tongues in my dreams, not from real life. Because when the battle is so fierce, God will give me a new, a new tongue to start facing them. I will just discover myself speaking in tongues, attacking them. And flying in a way. But do you know what? Since I came to realize that on the cross. I have been placed about these stupid things called demons. That my life is hid in Christ already. That he has done deliverance for me. That I am no longer under the oppression of Satan and his court. All those dreams and oppressions vanished. Till today. And I'm talking of almost 30 years now. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. If I didn't come to that knowledge and understanding, I will still be flying away from demons. And I will be coming to give you testimony. Ha! Ah. As that monster was coming with his big head and long tail and sharp teeth and fangs ready to devour me. Suddenly, the Lord gave me a wing and I just flew. And you will clap your hands, man of God. Man of ignorance. Man that is supposed to sleep and enjoy his sleep. He is being tormented every day. And he's coming to give testimony. The knowledge 
of God you have will determine your, what you enjoy from him. What do I say? If Israel did not know that he was a man of war, they would not bring down the wall of Jericho. If Abraham did not realize that he was Jehovah's children, his needs may not be met. Do you get what I'm saying? So what you need to pray for today, and which I want you to start praying, is for the progressive revelation of the finished work of Christ upon the cross for you. Turn it to prayers. Pray that God will give you that revelation. Paul said, I still want to know him. This one that I know is not enough. I am not yet there. We can look at Paul and say, giant of faith, great man, but he knows that what he can benefit, the level of victory he can walk in, is dependent on the level of the knowledge of Christ that he has. And he says, so I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to partake in his death. He wants to understand the nature of the death of God, wherein he has won the victory for us over every situation and circumstances. He realized that the more his eyes are open to see this truth of what, what Christ has done on the cross, what Christ has perfected for him on the cross, the more he can live his life in perfection. The more he can live his life free of struggles. The more he can live his life free of disturbances. The more he can live his life free of corrupting influences. The more he could live his life free of sin and the shackles that Satan and his cause brings into the way of man. Brethren, talk to God. What you need is the revelation and knowledge of Christ. That I may know him should be your cry today. It should be the cry of your heart. It is realizing that if I know little about Christ, I enjoy little victory. It is realizing that it is not how much you pray. It is not how many mountains you visit. It is not how many camp meetings you attend. It is about the knowledge of Christ, the level of the knowledge of Christ that is in you. The knowledge of truth that is revealed in you that will set you free. Children of God, my problem prayer point for you this afternoon is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. When he rose and gave you that victory, may God open my eyes to see the fullness of what it contains, to see the fullness of what it encompasses, to see the fullness of what provisions is in that rising of our Lord Jesus Christ. After he has perfected everything for me on the cross. The better you know, the more victorious your life will be. The better you know, the more you know, the more glorious your life becomes. God told the children of Israel, Arise, shine, your light has come. They were in ignorance. They did not know that the light is upon them, that the glory of God is risen upon them. God had to tell them, You are not shining. Because you don't know that the light of God is already upon you. And the glory of the Lord is already risen upon you. What you don't know will put you under. What you don't know will bring you under subjection. What you don't know will bring you under suppression. Christ has done it all on the cross. Christ has settled it all on the cross. Christ has finished it. If I keep on binding and losing over you, it will not help you until you come for that knowledge of the, what Christ has done for you on the cross of Calvary.
What he has wrought for you, what victory he has wrought for you. When he rose triumphantly over death, he swallowed death in victory. Open my eyes, O Lord. Open my eyes, O Lord. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about the resurrection. I want to know more about the power of His resurrection. Reveal the truth of the knowledge of Christ. Dead and risen unto me, O Lord, that I may live this life of victory. You will join me to this sing, sing this song as we round up. Victory in Jesus' name. Power. In Jesus' name, glory, hallelujah, there is victory in Jesus' name, sing victory, victory in Jesus' name. stand today before the God of heaven and heart whom I serve and declare in the name of my master and my king Jesus Christ that you go forth and walk in the victory that Christ has wrought for you in his finished work on Calvary. So shall it be in Jesus mighty name. Glory Glory 